Hi, everybody. I am Jessica Shore. I am the Director of Clinical Affairs and Advocacy here at Cure PSP. And I'm actually tuning in today from the Cure PSP offices in New York City. So that's a fun little change of pace for me. Uh, welcome to our Ask the Expert webinar series. We have two experts joining us today to cover a very important topic. But if you've watched our webinars before, you know that I always need to share a few housekeeping kind of items to start with, um, and then we'll dive into our program. So this program will be about an hour long, including the presentations from our two speakers and time for the question and answer session that I will be moderating with both of them. We are recording this webinar live, but it will be archived on our Facebook and on our YouTube channel for you or anybody else to view later on. If you had registered for this webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, I was sick two weeks ago, still lingering in there. Um, if you had registered for this webinar, you will receive an email after with the speaker's slides, as well as a new resource of ours that we will be talking about a little bit today. If you are watching this live, we will put those in the chat or the comment box of the platform that you're viewing this in. Our speakers will likely address many of your questions throughout their presentations. And realistically, we're never able to get to everyone's questions, but you are welcome to share or to ask a question um, in the chat section or the comment section of the platform that you're viewing this on. We will also be referring to many of the questions that many of you submitted when you registered to watch this webinar. We always have to note that information shared in this webinar is not meant to be medical advice. Um, and related to that, we also recommend not sharing personal health information in the chat and always encourage you to talk to your personal healthcare team um, if you have specific medical questions and concerns. You can also use the comment box to say hi and to share where you're tuning in from if you want. And I, I already see that a bunch of you have done that. So that's really fun. We have folks from all over the U.S. and beyond who are viewing this right now. And then lastly, this is really just based on, <clears throat> excuse me, on some feedback that we received from a handful of webinars in the past. But I want to emphasize that we do our best at Cure PSP to create our educational programs like this one to be relevant to as many people in our community as possible, whether they have a relationship with progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, or multiple system atrophy, or you know where they are in their disease journey. You might be viewing this as someone who's very newly diagnosed. You might be viewing this as somebody who's been living with the diagnosis for many, many years. So with that in mind, there will likely be some information you can relate to, some information that you can't. And no matter what, at the end of this, our hope is that you will leave this program with at least one helpful, at least one, and it'll be many more, but one helpful takeaway or new piece of information that can support you as you navigate your disease journey. Today's webinar will be focused on considerations for hiring professional in-home care when living with or caring for PSP, CBD, or MSA. This is a topic that is frequently brought up in our support groups and when we connect with folks individually um, because the decision to bring in outside help to offer assistance and companionship to somebody with the diagnosis and or to provide a family member with a break or respite from caregiving responsibilities is a really big one for many families. Uh, lots of considerations. And this is a very personal decision. So it's our aim to offer some guidance and some food for thought for you as you explore those options for you and your family. At this time, I would like to introduce our first speaker. I'll wait till she joins me. Our first speaker is Katrina Rudd. Hey, Katrina. Hi. Hi. Um, I'll let her tell you a little bit more about herself, but Katrina is a clinical social worker at the Cure PSP Center of Care at Massachusetts General Hospital. 
she is a wonderful, wonderful source of information and support for patients and families that she works with at the Movement Disorder Center, including helping them navigate difficult decisions and connecting to community resources. So I thought of her when we decided to have this as a topic so she can share her professional insights on in-home care with you all today. And then our second speaker will actually be introduced to you um, by Katrina, so you'll meet him later, but that will be Al Nixon, and he's a volunteer, longtime volunteer with Cure PSP, and he's going to share his firsthand experience with hiring professional in home care with his wife who had PSP. Katrina, always so lovely to get a chance to work with you. Appreciate you being here, and I'll let you take it from here. Sounds good. Thank you, Jessica, for that wonderful warm welcome. I am so pleased to be with you all today and talk about a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, hopefully, as Jessica said, you'll be able to take away some, some piece of information that's useful to you and your family um, moving forward. So just to give you a little bit of groundwork for kind of what we're covering today, I am going to start our session by providing some general information about professional in-home services, what they can look like, and, and ways that people access them. And then I'll turn it over to Al Nixon, who is going to give you some really good insight as a care partner himself who has utilized these services. Um, and of course, at the end, as Jessica said, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So uh, to just kind of ground us in some, some basic information to start here, um, when we're referencing professional in-home care, uh, we're talking about care that you are paying for and that could be provided actually in, in a variety of settings, whether it's your, your private house or apartment or potentially even in an assisted living environment. So wherever you call home, essentially. And these services are typically obtained either by using a home care agency or by finding a private individual that you hire and pay yourself. And there are pros and cons to kind of either of those options. So an agency, they're typically gonna be insured and they're bonded and, and responsible for vetting the aids, um, often doing background checks, as well as providing some level of training. Um, they also take on the responsibility typically for scheduling. So if an aide calls out sick or leaves the agency or just isn't a good fit for some reason, um, they would try to identify a replacement and, and work with you to do that. Now, agencies do typically charge a, a bit higher hourly rate as compared to private individuals. So this is gonna vary, and I know I'm talking to folks are around the country here. Um, a ballpark figure here in the Boston area is about $35 to $40 an hour for an agency aid. So that just gives you at least a frame of reference. Um, additionally, many agencies typically have an hourly minimum. So what that means is they're gonna wanna schedule aids for at least three or four hour blocks of time. Time. So that's something to think about. Um, working with a private individual, on the other hand, this can sometimes be a little bit less costly as they tend to have slightly lower um, hourly rates. But on the other hand, in that scenario, you are the one who's responsible for finding those aides out in the community on your own, vetting them, interviewing them, checking qualifications, and so on. So that can be quite time consuming and quite a bit of work and may not be really feasible for, for a lot of situations. Um, also, it can be difficult to know where to look for these folks. Um, I think in a lot of cases, individuals go this route when maybe they know someone who does this type of work or maybe through a friend of a friend or their social network. In some way, they, they get a reference or a referral. Um, otherwise, a lot of folks tend to, to work with an agency uh, to obtain home care services. Uh, in terms of just some of the different types of services offered, there is some variation in how these are, are categorized or labeled, but most agencies are going to refer to help with tasks like cleaning or laundry or um, meal preparation as either homemaking or companionship services. And the big thing to know about these is that this 
does not include hands-on assistance for things like transfers or getting to the bathroom or, or bathing. Um, so if an individual needs that type of hands-on help, you're usually talking about this next category, which is either personal care or home health aid or certified nursing assistant. Um, the terms kind of kind of vary a little bit, but those are some of the words to look out for if you are intending to um, use more of a hands-on assistance kind of support. Now, if more medical services are needed along the lines of like administering injections or catheter changes, things like that, that often falls into a higher category of private duty nursing. So this hopefully gives you a little bit of background. Um, before we move on to accessing these services, just a little note about adult day health programs. Uh, this is another option folks sometimes consider, particularly if they're looking for daytime support um, and can be, can be worthwhile. Uh, we can chat about it more during the Q&A if folks have interest, but our primary focus today is more on the in-home kind of services and, and adult day would be uh, at, a, at a location outside your home. So for now, we'll leave it at that. Um, moving into uh, uh, considering adding this type of time to add this type of support. Uh, Al is going to go through this in some more detail and really give you some, some great tips in terms of how he came to this decision. Um, but a few things I think of and often talk with individuals and families about um, are on the slide here. So if um, the person who's maybe the primary care partner in this situation is starting to experience more stress or feelings of burnout or noticing some changes in their health and wellness, um, becoming overly fatigued, not getting enough rest, that's one big indicator that often maybe some more help or support is needed. Another factor to think about is just whether there are any um, safety concerns that are starting to become more prevalent. So maybe some difficulty with, with transferring, you know, in and out of bed or, or seeing some more falls happening around the home. Um, it's often the case that individuals may not necessarily recognize the changes that are happening to their mobility, and they might need some more reminders or some more cueing to, to use that walker or to take time when, when getting in and out of the chair. And that level of supervision often requires some help. It's really hard for one person to be doing that uh, all on their own. Now, this last point here, too, that I really love to make when I get a chance to talk with people um, earlier on is that it can be very beneficial to take a bit more of a proactive approach. So starting these services sooner rather than later allows you to have that time to really talk to different agencies, find the one that feels like the best fit for you, um, and maybe start with a small number of hours, maybe just one day a week so that you all can kind of gradually get accustomed to having someone help out around the home. Um, it also gives you a chance to build some rapport and some trust with an aide and with an agency um, early on so that then it doesn't feel quite so overwhelming when maybe you have to start adding on more services or getting help with more personal care types of tasks. So just a few things to think about. Again, Al's going to cover that a bit more um, as well. I am also guessing that many folks are pretty concerned with how to pay for these services. So you may be very much recognizing that some extra help around the home would be really useful, um, but aren't sure how to go about um, uh, funding that assistance. And I will be totally honest, this is a really significant barrier for, for a lot of individuals. These services can be quite costly. Um, and while there are some programs and resources out there that can assist, um, they're not always comprehensive. And sometimes the eligibility criteria can be pretty limited. Uh, in terms of eligibility for public funding for these kinds of services, that's going to vary really significantly from state to state and region to region. So I'm going to do my best to cover kind of in broad strokes some of the general funding options, but know that you're probably going to then have to take this information and investigate a little further in your community to see what might be possible. So 
the first big program that many folks are familiar with, of course, is Medicare. Um, Medicare, unfortunately, does not cover ongoing home care services to help with things like housework and bathing and dressing and some of those daily care tasks. Um, this tends to come as a pretty big surprise to most people. Um, Medicare does cover what's called short-term uh, home health or home medical services. So what they mean by that are things like physical therapy, occupational, speech, some, some nursing, and it's, it's limited to usually a short period of time, maybe a month or two, following a major change in status or hospitalization or a fall, perhaps. Um, and it's specifically those medical services that they cover. Occasionally, there may be a bit of home health aid, maybe once or twice a week included in that. But it, again, it's very short term and it's going to end as soon as those, those skilled services have to, um, to pull out. So uh, it, it's a challenge for folks um, in terms of not having real access to home care through Medicare. Now, one sort of exception or, or component of Medicare that's a little different and that does cover some additional in-home support is hospice care. Uh, this does require that a physician certifies that you have less than six months to live. Um, with slower progressive neurologic uh, illnesses, that that certification can be a little bit more of a gray area um, in terms of how to determine when it might be appropriate. Um, I encourage folks always to talk with their doctors about this um, because you know hospice services can be a nice option with some, some level of support provided. Now, that being said, it's also important to know that hospice is not going to provide 24-hour in-home care. That's kind of another misconception that they will come in and kind of do that round-the-clock care. Um, in general, with hospice, you will get access to some, some in-home nursing support in terms of occasional visits. You, you do usually get access to some home health aid, maybe an hour or two a day, um, as well as perhaps some volunteer companion services or um, some help coordinating, you know, medical equipment, things like that. Um, but again, it does still tend to require pretty substantial um, either paid care or care provided by, by family members. Um, so that kind of is, is Medicare in a nutshell as it relates to home care at least. Um, moving on to Medicaid, which is a different program. This is a state-based insurance program. So every state has their own Medicaid eligibility criteria um, in terms of the income limits, the asset limits, um, as well as differences in exactly what kinds of home care services they'll cover for eligible individuals. Um, a few things about Medicaid. Again, you want to look to your state to figure out what the criteria are. Um, I always encourage people to look into this, even if you don't think you would be eligible. I, I hear from folks that they were denied for a public benefit program in the past, so they, they don't even check into this. Um, depending where you live, some states do have slightly expanded eligibility criteria specifically geared toward folks who need more um, in-home support in order to remain living in their homes, you know, due to their, their medical conditions. So it's good to check. Uh, those programs do often require a clinical evaluation by a nurse or a case manager. And when you're going through that evaluation process, you really want to emphasize all the different things that you could need help with. So not just talking about how things look on your best day, but really being upfront about how things look on your most challenging day or most challenging time of day so that they can get a, a really full sense of, of the picture and perhaps maximize what you may be eligible for. Um, also, in some cases, if you maybe meet the income criteria but are over the established asset limit in your region, um, it may be worthwhile to connect with an elder law attorney just to see if there's any options. Sometimes some, some rearranging of, of funds is possible to become eligible for, for some of these programs. But the rules are pretty complicated, so you definitely want to work with someone who is well-versed in the Medicaid rules and, and elder law rules in your state. Uh, moving on to a few other programs here to consider. So uh, the VA is, is another possibility. If you are a veteran, 
you can check in with your local VA rep. They have what's called an aid in attendance program. Um, again, there are income limitations here, so not everyone is going to qualify for this. Um, but based on income, based on your service history, uh, your disability status, uh, and, and some other kind of criteria, they can take a look and see if you may be eligible for um, a higher pension or a little more funding to help offset the cost of home care. The next option is one that um, is specifically if you have purchased long-term care insurance at some point in the past. Uh, these insurance policies are sold kind of out on the private market, so they vary from policy to policy in terms of what they cover. Uh, if you do have one of these policies, I strongly encourage you to reach out to your insurance company get information from them on what is covered. Usually some form of home care is, is included in that benefit. Um, and you also wanna find out what is necessary in order to start claiming benefits. Usually you have to kind of reach a certain clinical need level in terms of your daily tasks uh, in order to start receiving some of those benefits. So good to look into that early when possible. Uh, in some cases, also different states may have additional programs to help offset the cost of home care. Uh, some of these are geared towards elders, but others may be geared towards adults with disabilities um, or even caregivers. So some states have funded some caregiver respite programs to help with, with some home care costs. Um, to find out more about these, you're usually going to want to check in with your local senior center or council on aging, maybe even your town office. A lot of times they can kind of get you directed to uh, the right place to go for you. And I'll also share a resource to help you search for some of those contacts. Uh, and then there are a few nonprofit organizations, including Cure CSP, uh, that have some designated respite grants. So these tend to be pretty short term. They're not going to provide ongoing care, but they can give you a little bit of funding so that you get some services in place, maybe have a little breathing room to then put in a longer term plan or, or figure out what else you might be able to um, apply for or become eligible for. And then, of course, the last one I, I can't uh, uh, leave without, obviously, addressing the private pay option. Um, this is, of course, you know, uh, not something that's available to everyone. But if you do have some funds available, many individuals do end up paying privately for services. Um, for folks who are maybe trying to pull together funding, sometimes using some crowdfunding resources like a GoFundMe page or something along those lines, um, I've seen be, be potentially a useful option to kind of let friends and family and others know how they might be able to support you in a way that's really going to, um, you know, give you some, some good practical help in the form of home care. Now I'm guessing I've been talking a lot and relatively quickly, so this may feel a little overwhelming. Um, I wanted to kind of lay out for you at least some starting points. So some, some places to start when you leave this talk. So with all of this information, I think one initial great starting point that, that anyone can do is to try to again, connect with one of those local or state service agencies. Um, to figure out if you're eligible for any sort of support, any sort of paid home care through your state, your county, Medicaid, one of those types of, of services. Um, that's a, a great thing. It can help you know what your options are. And then from there, you can also take a look at, okay, what's my personal kind of financial situation and budget? Do I have any, any room to maybe be able to pay for some of these services? And if so, you know, how much? Uh, and then another key part of the process is really sitting down and thinking about what are the tasks or the times of day that are the most challenging or, or even just time consuming, you know, and really prioritize those things where you think having some help with those tasks would have the greatest impact. That information is going to be very useful to you as you take the next step, which is to reach out to some local home care agencies or individual aides if, if you know of some, um, because then you're going to be able to relay what your needs are and, you know, kind of how much time you're thinking about and have a get a sense of cost and such. 
Uh, and of course, you don't need to do all of this on your own. Um, there are some options out there for support. So connecting with the staff at your neurology office is often a great uh, step to take. Um, as I mentioned, different community agencies are likely going to have social workers or case managers on staff. So those are great to check in with. Um, if you're really hoping for maybe some more hands-on support with all of this, a geriatric care manager is a professional who, for a private pay rate, can help you sort through different agencies, aids, um, putting together a real comprehensive kind of uh, in-home care plan. And then, of course, your social network, you know, connecting with friends and family and local support groups to get their tips and um, feedback, particularly those who have maybe been through this um, in some way them, themselves. Uh, now, before I pass it on to Al, again, you all will get these slides, so you don't have to write these, these sites down, but um, just a few resources I wanted to share. So to find those local service agencies in your area, that elder care locator site is going to be really useful. That's good nationwide. You punch in your zip code and it'll kind of direct you to a couple options. Same with the Centers for Independent Living. Um, if you're interested in that geriatric care manager option, that Aging Life Care Association has a great directory of those, um, as well as the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys, if you're thinking that connecting with one of those uh, professionals would be helpful for you. So uh, that is quite a bit. Again, we'll have time for questions and answers. But uh, at this point, I do want to pass it over to my wonderful co-presenter, um, Al Nixon, who's going to share some experiences that he's had with utilizing home care services and some some really great uh, <clears throat> tips that he's he's learned along the way. So <clears throat> Al, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Katrina. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as a Cure PSP volunteer, peer supporter, and I uh, co-facilitate the Connecticut Support Group, uh, these are some of the questions I get asked often <clears throat> by persons who are considering home health care. And today I hope to answer these questions for you by sharing my personal experiences with the two home health care agencies we used, their aids, and the various situations that we encountered. Now, let me start with some background information. Uh, my wife, Eileen, had PSP, and she died seven years ago, uh, just three weeks before our 53rd anniversary. Uh, this photo was taken on our 50th wedding anniversary, Eileen, our four daughters, and me. And as I mentioned, we used two home care uh, agencies, one in Connecticut and one in Florida when we were on a three-month vacation. Now, fortunately, my wife had a long-term care insurance policy, and this helped to defray some of the cost. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, how did I know when it was time to consider in-home health care? I didn't. Let me repeat that. I didn't. The last person a caregiver thinks about is himself. So I had no idea that my physical and mental health were being affected so much. Now, unfortunately, my two youngest daughters are in health care, and they recognized I was getting burned out. And fortunately, they approached me and told me that it was time for me to get some help. And the symptoms they told me about, and I, of course, should have recognized these, were Eileen was getting up four, five, six times at night, so I was getting very little sleep. She was falling more often, so I couldn't leave her alone. And I was really becoming overwhelmed. The many doctor's appointments, physical and occupational therapy appointments, trips to the emergency room, preparing meals, doing laundry, grocery shopping, and the list goes on. Uh, and putting my needs aside, there are two additional reasons to consider in-home care in my mind. Uh, the first is Eileen was very concerned that she'd become a burden to me and her family. And having home health care aides allowed me to get out, rejoin the guys for our weekly breakfast. I could take a brief walk. And this wound up being visible and tangible evidence to her that she was not becoming a burden to me. And second, she was very clear she wanted to die at home and with no heroics. And in-home health care with hospice enabled us to meet her wishes. Now, when it comes to time to select an agency, here are some things to consider. And as Katrina pointed out, you really need to identify your home health care needs and be sure to consider your future needs. Uh, you may want to start with a companion, but be sure the agency can upgrade 
to a CNA if soon you'll need help with, for your loved one with feeding, showering, toileting, and so forth. Now, I found my Connecticut agency through the recommendation of a very good friend. I had asked several friends who had worked with agencies, and of them, he had the most compelling case for the agency, for his agency, so I decided to start there. Now, the agency owner came into our home for the interview, which included a safety check. She made recommendations on where I should install grab bars, take up throw rugs, and so forth. And she answered all my questions and vice versa. So frankly, I saw no need to interview additional agencies. We, we just hit it off and I, I got a good feeling about her. If, however, you don't have a strong recommendation from a, a reliable friend, I would suggest you interview at least two or three agencies. Now, be sure to ask each agency if they've had prior experience with PSP, CBD, or MSA, and most likely not. So ask them about other movement disorder diseases, such as Parkinson's disease or ALS. And recently, Cure PSP has just put together a resource, professional in-home care tips, which Katrina referred to. And that is a very good list of questions for you to ask during an agency interview. Now the Connecticut agency knew of a Florida agency that, and so I used that one when we went down to Florida on our three, three, week, three month vacation. Now as a side note, if you have long-term care insurance, as we did, often they must approve the agency that you select. Now the agency will have a contract for you to sign that outlines both their responsibilities and yours the hourly rates the aides would be paid, and so forth. And be sure to read it and request any changes in it if you deem them necessary. Now, here are some of the attributes of the, my Connecticut agency, and these were discussed thoroughly at that initial interview. Uh, they're in no particular order. The owner was an RN. It's a medium-sized agency, about 70 to 80 aides. And I found this one important. The aides they hire only came from recommendations of their existing and prior or prior aides. They did not advertise for aides. Aides were not allowed to use their cell phones while on, they were on duty. Your loved one is their primary concern and they shouldn't be texting friends, etc. Now the owner called me shortly after each new aide started to ask how they were doing and then she would specifically ask me about their cell phone usage. And then she'd call me about a week or two later, same questions. The agency was accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They created a plan of care with my help. Each shift and aid kept a log of what they did, showers, toileting, any problems they encountered, and so forth. And this was very important for three reasons. One, so the next shift knew what the, had occurred on the prior shift. Second, we took the log with us to doctor's appointments and as it helped to answer questions. And three, the agency, agency sent copies of these logs to our long-term care insurance company as evidence the work was done and that we should be compensated by the insurance. Our agency and the aides worked very well with hospice. Uh, we had a live-in aid for three weeks when I had rotator cuff surgery early on and Connecticut, as I'm sure most states, require that a live-in aide have eight hours of personal time each day, plus six hours of uninterrupted sleep. So unless your loved one sleeps through the night, understand if you have a live-in aide, you're going to need an additional aide, a fourth shift, so to speak. And when in Florida, I had aides 24-5. I covered the weekends because it was very difficult to get uh, aides on the weekends. Now, once you've selected the agency and they come on board, realize it takes time, maybe two to four weeks to get things sorted out. It's a learning curve for both parties. And it was the first time I ever worked with health, home health care aides. PSP was new to the agency, plus not all aides worked out. So I recommend you take the time to train both the agency and each new aide about your loved one's disease. So all of you will be working effectively together. And to do this, I put together a three-section document and spent anywhere from 
30 minutes to an hour going over this first with the agency and then with each new aide as they came on board. Now, background. I wanted to know the first document, background. I wanted to know, one of the aides to know who Eileen was prior to the onset of PSP. She was very active. She was a nurse, which resonated with them. And I emphasize she still had good cognition. Uh, I listed second, the second document listed typical PSP symptoms and Cure PSP has an awful lot of good information on this. Now I'm not gonna talk about each point on this slide. I just wanna show you the types of things I covered and you will be getting the slides later, but I'll highlight a few. Uh, point one emphasized Eileen's falls that they were backwards and sudden which is, is very unusual for most diseases. Uh, and then points two and four highlighted her communication issues. The aides needed to know that. Now here's the Eileen's specific needs at that point in time. Now I updated this every three months or so as her symptoms progressed. And I'll, I'll highlight a few again. Point two, stress the importance of patients. Point six, I covered eating and swallowing issues. Now, discussing these three documents with each aid not only helped them learn about PSP and Eileen's needs, it also helped both of us to get to know each other better. It was a great form of an icebreaker, so to speak. Now, let's talk about AIDS, and uh, here are some of my ex experiences. Chemistry between your loved one and your aid is critical, and I cannot emphasize that enough. All aides are technically competent, but if your loved one doesn't get along with an aide, call the agency and ask for the change of aides as soon as possible. Don't waste your time trying to work with and change an aide's disposition and personality. I found it couldn't be done. I was surprised to find some aides are very deferential at first and will be hesitant to tell you about any issues or problems they may have. So you need to let them know you want to know issues they're having, anything you can help them out with, how they're doing, ask them how they're doing, and any suggestions they have. Now, if an aide calls out sick, the agency should get a substitute immediately. However, I found that a replacement aide in the learning curve to get them up to speed was often unsettling for Eileen. Because I was retired, most of the time I covered the shift myself and did not get a replacement. I let the agency know that. Uh, night shift aides are very, very special people as they must stay up all night and finding a good one is not easy. Now what I did the first week we had a night, a new night shift aide, I would get up in the middle of the night several times to check the aide was awake and doing their job. Now we had several aides, both in Connecticut and Florida, not a lot, but they fell asleep and did not hear my wife calling out whereas I did, and I was in another room. I woke them, we helped Eileen, and then I let them finish their shift. And in the morning, I called the agency, told them what had happened, and both the Connecticut and Florida agency changed that aid immediately. Now, I found there's no point in arguing with an aid that they were sleeping, because every aid I caught sleeping on the job denied that they had been sleeping. Let your agency handle it. I mean, that's what they're there for. For the night shift, I also purchased a baby monitor so the aide could keep an eye on Eileen from another room if they desired. Now, good aides take a real interest in your loved one's well-being. They made Eileen feel normal by helping her with her daily showers. They helped dress her in clean clothes so she wasn't in her pajamas all day. They applied makeup, helped her brushing her teeth, and so forth. They also took her outdoors when the weather was good played games, dominoes, and they did not sit around all day watching TV. Now, about once a week, we tried to get out to a restaurant, and I always had the aide on duty join us. Of course, this was very important because if when Filene needed to use a restroom, the aide was there to help her. Plus, it was a real treat for the aide to get out to a restaurant. Now, one of my daughters works in Manhattan in the fashion business and she would gift the aides design samples from her company. These were uh, design samples of purses, scarves, hats. Her company would otherwise give them to employees or just discard them. 
And when the aides had the opportunity to get some items like this, it was really important to them and it made our relationship with them even better. You and your aides will often be talking back and forth, especially at mealtime. So don't forget to include your loved one in the conversation. There can be a four or five second delay in their response. So give your loved one time to say what they want and join in the conversation before the topic has changed. You certainly don't want your loved one feeling like a fifth wheel. Also, since most aides are used to helping people with dementia and they want to be sure they're understood, they tend to talk loudly. And I mean, I had a couple that really talk loudly. Be sure to tell them that this is not necessary. Uh, and this point was contained uh, on my third slide, point number two, along with patients. Now, often I had an aide accompany us to doctor's appointments, and I would ask them to contribute to the conversation. Since they were with, the, with Eileen continuously, they could help me answer questions such as how she eating, any changes since the last visit, and so forth. I also had them accompany us to speech, physical, and occupational therapy sessions. And this way, the aides learned how to do the therapy sessions with Eileen at home. And this was very, very effective. It really helped Eileen a lot. Now, I have two uh, last words of caution. Hide and put in a safe place your jewelry, valuables, your list of passwords, that sort of thing. There's no need to tempt stealing. And I do know of a person who had an aide who mistreated their loved one. And fortunately, this was caught on a hidden camera. So this is something you may want to consider, especially if you leave your loved one in the care of an aide for several hours or more. In other words, if you're working. Now, I didn't encounter this because I was retired. Now, in conclusion, a good agency and good aides are an invaluable asset for both you and your loved one. Friends would say to me, you're so fortunate to have such good aides for Eileen. And I'd, I'd reply, well, that's true, but the aides are really here for me. I'm the fortunate one because I couldn't have done it without them. Good aides allowed me to transition from being a care, caregiver back to being a caring husband, and they became part of my family. I still keep in touch with four of them after seven years. And I also keep in touch with the owner of the Connecticut agency, and we get together for lunch twice a year. And of course, I recommend our agency to friends in need. And finally, if and when you decide to employ in-home health care, I hope your experience will be as good as mine. I really did have a good experience. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Alan, Katrina, that was such valuable information. I mean, like covering exactly what this kind of care is and can do and the different options for it. And then, Al, you're your tips for you know being your own advocate for finding the right care if, you're, if it's not the good if it's not a good fit bringing your you know and then or it's, it's not a good fit that you have the right to find someone who is the good fit bringing your wife's perspective and voice into it too I mean everything you all shared is super tangible for our community so I have so many questions and only 15 minutes to ask them so I'm gonna do my best um, I also just I want to remind folks that if you have other questions, you can put them in the chat, but I'm going to refer to the questions right now that were sent to us during registration and some other ones that I've seen come through. You all covered a lot of them. So one that we received from a couple of different people is with this disease, will we eventually need 24 seven care? And if so, um, and I know, you know, we can't say that for yes or no definitively for everyone, but some, you know, folks pl trying to plan ahead. If so, if someone does need 24-7 care eventually with the disease, how do you implement that keeping someone at home and how do you begin to estimate the, estimate the cost around that? Um, and Katrina, I guess I'll start with you wondering if you have any advice for these folks. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think, as you said, there's there's going to be some variation. Um, in general, I think for a lot of folks, eventually, round-the-clock support is needed. Now, whether that's going to be entirely provided by paid 
professional in-home uh, services or whether some of that may be provided by perhaps a care partner in, in a caregiving role or maybe other family members who are also assisting um, is, is going to be different from situation to situation. So, um, but I would say in general, your loved one is likely going to need care um, throughout the day and nighttime at some point in, in the, the, their disease. Um, in terms of cost, um, I kind of referenced the, the hourly rate. Um, so you can imagine we're, if you're paying solely out of pocket, we are talking about thousands of dollars uh, per month, which is 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 not cheap. Um, I think the the end cost is going to depend on whether you qualify for any of those public programs that I that I mentioned, or as as Al's experience, you know, he had the long term care insurance to help offset uh, some of that. So. Um, just kind of looking into any and all resources that might be able to support you to um, to to be paying for for this care. Um, Al, I don't know if you have any other thoughts to They've chime in on pretty it. Pretty well. I mean, I, I did eventually go to uh, twenty four around the clock, but it, you know, it was it was staggered. Uh, I got the night night aid first, and then uh, maybe two, three more, three four months later, I got um, like a second shift. And then eventually went to three shifts, and I was fortunate with my four girls. Uh, they would they would spell me occasionally, give me some respite care. Uh, uh, I remember uh, twice. Uh, well, actually, once it was I went down to South Carolina for three or four days and played some golf with a bunch of guys that I had known for years, and uh, that did wonders for me. So family members can come in and contribute, but it, it unfortunately will most likely eventually become twenty four seven. 24 seven, no matter if, even if it's not 24 seven professional care, just 24 seven right. support from whatever support team that is for the yeah. individual person. And a lot of families, unfortunately, end up having to kind of cobble together between adult daycare and professional care and family members and friends and at some point have 24 yeah. seven support. Um, I just want to acknowledge really quickly that, you know, a lot of what we're talking about today is sort of specific to the United States, right? But we have someone who's viewing who shared in the chat, they're from Egypt. So, you know, and like we serve, we support people in Canada and all over the world. So I think it's all, a, a lot of what we're talking about might not necessarily pertain as far as resources and costs, but do pertain as far as like finding the right person and what they can do and, you know, self-advocacy and making the decision and all of that. So I do, if you live outside of the U.S. and this doesn't pertain to you, definitely recommend figuring out what is available based on, you know, your healthcare and long-term care system and supports in your country or area. Um, okay. So, that brings me to another question. I'm just looking at my questions here. You both touched on this kind of a little bit, but I have a few questions that came up from folks on the advantages or disadvantages of using uh, in-home care versus adult daycare. And then we also had someone else write in that said, what are the advantages, advantages and disadvantages of bringing in outside care into the home versus someone moving into a long-term care facility. It's a lot of people say that they want to keep the person at home or that person wants to stay at home. And of course, that's 100% understandable. We all want to be in our own home. And sometimes for a variety of reasons, people need to make the decision to move to a facility. And so how do you consider that when you're exploring in-home care? Katrina, do you want to yeah. share that yeah, I'll um, chime in on that. So I guess the first piece, the adult day health option, um, which I only briefly referenced and, and kind of figured it might come up. Um, I have had folks who have uh, really appreciated the option to maybe try an adult day health program um, in their area for some some pretty good services during the daytime. 
Um, there's pros and cons to that. So I think one of the benefits of an adult day health program is that um, they tend to roll in quite a few services and, and kind of different interesting things that might be useful to the person. So it's a social opportunity. Um, also, they, they tend to kind of, a lot of them will provide transportation and a meal while you're there. Um, sometimes they'll even have like some exercise or some, you know, different wellness types of activities involved. Um, so I have had folks who have um, found it to be a good use of time and, and pretty enjoyable from a cost perspective. It can also be pretty cost effective because usually the number of hours you get covered for the day, uh, it's, it's less of a cost than if you were getting that same amount of time with a one-on-one -on -one aid in the home. Um, so I do have some families who kind of kind of use a combination of, of both. Um, some of the downsides, uh, it can be a challenge to find a day program that feels appropriate for you. So a lot of these programs tend to be geared towards older adults, more of an elderly population. So it may not always feel like a great fit socially um, for you or for your loved one. Um, I definitely encourage people to go. You can visit them. You can kind of see what they have to offer, see if it matches up with your interests. Um, but I think that's kind of the biggest challenge is finding, finding a good fit. Um, the other piece that can be a challenge is sometimes the hours don't exactly line up with like our traditional work work day. So for say care partners who are working and maybe individuals going to the program, they sometimes have to piece together some, some coverage for like the later afternoon or evening um, around that, but otherwise can be a good, a good fit. Um, for considering other living environments, um, you know, I, I do think that at a certain point, sometimes due to a variety of situations, maybe even availability of home care, sometimes people have to consider whether maybe another option like an assisted living or a skilled nursing facility might be a better fit for, um, for their needs or their loved one's needs. And that's a really tough decision to make. I think um, similar to investigating home care agencies, if you are looking to go that route, it's really important to visit multiple locations, whether we're talking assisted living or skilled nursing facility, talk with friends and family. As Al said, he got a really great recommendation on an agency. You can kind of do the same thing and 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 crowdsource some information about some of the, the facilities in your area. Um, one little note I'll just add about assisted living. <laughs> um, it can be a great option, but you have to understand that they are not going to provide one-on-one -on -one kind of round the clock care. So if you are needing more care, you often either need to add on some some private pay services on top of what you're already doing through the assisted living um, or, or be it still like a relatively high level of independence for that to be a workable option. So those are some brief, <laughs> brief-ish thoughts. No, it's a, it's a loaded question. Yeah, right? yeah, um, it's it's a lot. Al, what about how did you decide to bring in in-home care versus well, it was, was my wife's care? Wish. Yeah, oh, my yeah. wife's wish was say, and she really made a point of that. And fortunately, with the long-term care insurance, uh, we were able to afford it. Uh, so I, I frankly did not consider, uh, uh, you know professional home so to speak now we did yeah. i did do have one person in our support group whose uh, wife was discharged i forget what issue she had that she was in a hospital and she went into a uh, uh a support group you know into a support home so to speak it worked out pretty well and i think for cost reasons he she is still there uh rather than going into in home because she she had to be in that uh uh i won't call it a nursing home but a, a home for you know, several weeks as part of a rehabilitation. And, you know, so that that's what I think helped make the decision for him. Yeah. And I've seen that as the case for a number of other families as well. And I do want to know that someone in the live chat just now said, asked, is assisted living the same as 24 seven care facility? And it, and it is right. Katrina, I mean, it's like, there's different levels of long-term care, facility-based care. So assisted living and then their skilled nursing facility is sort of the step above that, but essentially they're places where people go to live and different 
services are provided, I would recommend, because that's like a whole topic yeah. by itself. We should have another webinar on that. But on our educational pages on our website, there is a new fact sheet up there about understanding different levels of long-term care that could help you know, answer that question a little bit more in depth. Um, Al, a question for you. I want to talk about nighttime care because a couple people asked about that in registration. Someone just shared in the chat, once the patient is using diapers or pull-ups at night and does not need to get up to use the bathroom, why would night care be necessary? At present, my husband sleeps well through the night. And then I also had people who had asked um, in registration, uh, you know, what would somebody do during night? Why would, you know, should I hire someone in the night versus the day versus both? Oh. Uh, what did your caregivers do at night? Yeah, well, uh, uh, despite the, uh, the the adult diapers and that sort of thing, uh, the bed really got soaked, <laughs> and they would change that. Plus, uh, Eileen was not a when she was uh, sleeping, she was not uh, stationary, and she fell out of bed a number of times. I had to put bed rails on, and one of the, one of the aides, uh, one of the aides down in Florida. Eileen actually fell out of bed and the aide was was there in the room with her and didn't hear her. And, but yet I heard her cry out. Uh, so I think it all depends. And she had restless leg syndrome, uh, which I think complicated things. I, I think it really depends on your situation. Uh, uh, the, the, the type of uh, question, the way it was proposed, why would I need it if such and such and such? Well, then you don't need it. <laughs> I needed it because I was getting up five, six times a night, you know, uh, uh, because she was calling out and needed help and that sort of thing. So, uh, I mean, if, if you don't need it, you don't need it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, you touched on both the big, the two big things that I think of or hear from families of like falls at night or someone getting up at night right? and going to the bathroom. And if sometimes families, that's when they decide to hire someone. Cause if a family care partner is just exhausted the next day from having gotten out of bed with their person eight times, that can be a good reason to bring in somebody. Yep. If everyone's sleeping okay and the safety risks are low, then you might not need it. Right. Okay, I want to do a quick time check. I still have a few other questions I'd really like us to get to. So maybe we could just go over by a few minutes. Is that okay, everybody? Yep. Yeah. yeah? Okay. And people watching this, if you need to go, because we'll be at time, then go ahead and do that. And this will be archived so you can check it out later. But so many good questions. Okay, so one of the ones that I'd gotten during registration was I'm thinking, I'm trying to think about what a professional caregiver could help with. And sort of a, another part of that question is, how do I balance my partner's sense of independence and keeping her safe with tasks, oh, and keeping her safe with tasks? She's always been a very strong, proud, and fiercely independent woman. Whoever wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I can start. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, just popped into my head. Uh, I had uh, two. Uh, we're talking about the fiercely independent. I had two aides uh, that were very uh, self-confident, had a great sense of humor, great people skills, and and I know they could work with work with a person like that. And I think when you're uh, hiring an agency and you're talking to the agency, ask them if they have people that can um, accommodate that sort of situation. And and if so, would one or two of those people be available to them? Uh, because my wife was very independent too. Uh, uh, now she she uh, didn't, didn't fight it too much, but the AIDS just made it so much easier for her. Uh, and, and I think the other thing too is we, we didn't, uh, it wasn't 24 seven right off the bat, you know, it was, we worked into it. And, uh, I think that, that, that certainly helped too, because, you know, I, it was first time for me. So I, I was, I was a little uncomfortable on what's going, what's going to happen. What are these aides doing all? And fortunately I got one of these, uh, senior among equal type aides right off the bat. She showed me what an aide could do and, uh, and how, how she could help. And it, it just, uh, made the whole whole situation a lot easier, just diffused all of these questions and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. For, I think about what that, like two, two points I want to emphasize there. I mean, first of all, 
independence, like we all strive, I think, to be independent people, I think, and all of us can relate to that for ourselves, for our loved ones. And we're an interdependent species. I think we forget about that sometimes too. And so I, I love that you advocated for your wife, Al, to share with her, you know, her caregivers of like, she is still an independent person. Here is who she is. Here is who she was. And you need to support that while also helping to, you know, assist her and, and keeping her safe. Yep. And I can't emphasize enough what you've brought up a few times now of you can start slow with care early on and increase as needed. It's a really nice way to have like a foot in the door and kind of get used to what this could look like. A lot of people I think think of it's all or nothing like I'm going from not having professional care to now I need somebody every single day for 12 hours and it does not have to be that way. Sorry, I Katrina, I, I want to hear your initial <laughs> thoughts on this too. No, I think you all covered it beautifully, honestly. Um, you know, the only other piece I would just add into that is if it's possible to engage your loved one in the process, you know, um, so that they're a part of it and it doesn't feel like you're just kind of making all of these decisions on their behalf. You know, I know sometimes um, communication can be challenging, but as, as much as you're able to um, talking through things together and figuring out if there are particular tasks that your loved one is still really finding a lot of joy and meaning in, then maybe not giving those over to to the aid to do and finding a way to like adapt that particular task so that it's still possible and then designating things that your loved one maybe doesn't care about you know scrubbing the toilet or um, lugging things down to the laundry or whatever it may be and and kind of divvy things up in a way that makes sense and feels like they're still having some sense of control over the process yeah. yeah, that's that's a good point because uh, I I did that uh, when whenever you know we were shopping or something like that with an aid, Eileen always selected what the food was and that and that sort of thing. The the other thing too, and I, I think it depends on the relationship between the caregiver and their loved one. Um, as I concluded, <clears throat> I actually felt the aids helped me more than Eileen. So you could propose that to this independent person. Say, hey, I I need these. I need this help as much as you do. And that, that what depends on the relationship those two individuals have, but that, that might help uh, along with what Katrina just said. Yes. I'm, I'm looking at my questions. I'm looking at the time. I'm going to ask so many more questions, but I'm going to pick two big ones. Okay. <laughs> um, one is, and I guess this sort of continues with what you were just talking about, Al, so I'll start with you on this. How do you spend time? as a care partner when the caregivers are there. Like, I think I hear that a lot from people of like, I don't even know what I would do with myself or my time. Or like, do I stay in the house? Do I leave the house? If I stay in the house, what if they still call for me? Um, you know, what, how did you spend your time? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, everybody has a lot of things to do. So, uh, uh, you know, I was on the computer and that sort of thing when they were with Eileen, we did, spend time together uh, at mealtime. I had the aides join us. Now, both agencies had the first day that the aides had to bring their own food. And I said, well, enough of that, you join us for, for mealtime. So we, we, we did do that. Whenever we, we went out for a lot of walks, even when Eileen was in a wheelchair and it was me and the aide and Eileen and the three of us would chat as we were walking. Uh, and, you know, I occasionally do some laundry or whatever. Uh, I, I didn't even, that didn't even enter my mind is uh, I, I wound up having plenty to do both with the AIDS and, and, and without the AIDS. And uh, uh, that just worked for me. So. It sounds like you thought about what you need to do and also things that you want to do. Right. And, and as I said, you know, I still keep in touch with four of the AIDS. We, we, we became, became really good friends. So, uh, you know, and if Eileen was occasionally would watch the Hallmark channel uh, with the aide, I'd, I'd sit there and watch with her as well. And we'd talk about what was going on. Uh, that's what I know. Uh, and, you know, fortunately I was retired so I could do that, but I, I never had a problem of wondering what to do. There was always 
always something something to do. Someone in the chat just asked, what housekeeping chores can you ask a caregiver to do? And I, I love that question because I think a lot of people, when I talk to them, think that, you know, like they might already have someone who comes and cleans the house or they don't want to just hire someone to clean the house. So what, you know, how do we yeah. distinguish professional? Well, I'll caregivers? give you my personal. I, I We did have a, 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 they'll do. I have a gal that comes in and cleans the house uh, uh, every, every month. And back then it was uh, twice a week. I mean, uh, twice a month. And, uh, but the aides uh, could do laundry. They could help cook a meal, uh, uh, you know, make the bed. They, you know, they, they did that, um, just keep things tidy. Um, and of course they were with Eileen an, an awful lot. So, uh, but the, you know, it, it worked out well with the, uh, the cleaning lady we had plus them, it, it worked out fine. You know, there was plenty for the aides to do. And, you know, particularly when with PSP, uh, you know, when, when uh, Eileen, and I, I know from this for, for a fact from our support group, PSP patients are very impulsive. And you say, you know, just sit there for a minute and I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> they get up and they want to go, you know, the minute you're out of the room. So uh, uh, the aides have to spend a lot of time being close close to them. And it, it freed me up to do a, a few few other things. Like I, I'd run out and go grocery shopping. I, I didn't have the aides do that. Uh, and then, you know, pick up laundry and things like that. So uh, it, it's a good question, but uh, you'll have plenty to do. Trust me. <laughs> um, the only quick thing I'll just add to that, I think, Al, your point related to PSP is is really good and important. I think some of the folks I work with who maybe have other diagnoses where that impulsivity is not so much of, of a, a present um situation it maybe are using the aides to do a lot more housework um, usually agencies at least when you engage with them they're going to let you know kind of what tasks are appropriate to ask the aides to do versus anything yeah. that for whatever reason they don't want them to do for example i know some agencies kind of try to steer away from like heavy chore cleaning you know they don't want them out like cleaning the gutters or um, up on yeah. ladders, dusting the fan blades. So sometimes there are some limitations, but in general, what you think of as like light housework tends to fall into that um, appropriate category. Yeah. A lot of times they'll have like how limits on how much they can lift. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Depending. Um, okay. My last question since, since we're over time here, but I think it's a really, really important one. You too touched on this a little bit, but just to delve a little bit deeper, um, coming from registration questions, how to find caregivers that understand PSP's unique ways that it affects our spouses over Parkinson's disease. And another way of thinking about this is how do you educate a caregiving agency or a caregiver on this person's you know, specific diagnosis and, and symptoms that they need to be mindful? of and like and i'm thinking of this now too because you mentioned like with psp there's the impulsivity and here's how it shows up yeah. and so what you need to do around it well i I did, wanna... it those, I did it through those three documents i prepared because uh, and i didn't do that right off the bat i uh, i pretty quickly realized the aids needed something like just what you described jessica because the disease, the disease was so new to them and they they so i but I just kind of developed developed it myself, and and those are like a you know just bullet points that I had, and each one of them I would spend oh a good five, eight minutes with the aid on every one of those, talking about the impulsivity or uh, uh, problems with her swallowing, and these are things you have to watch for, and they they would would ask me questions going back and forth, and that that that's how I I accomplish that. But, uh, but I found that very, very helpful because the eight, you know, the eight, most AIDS have, have never dealt with PSP or even Parkinson's. They have, I don't think any of uh, the AIDS we had had ever dealt with Parkinson's either for some reason. And I guess it's also, it goes along with how it's different from Alzheimer's disease, which many AIDS yep. have worked with. Yes. Yep. Katrina, anything you want to add to that yeah. question? Yeah, I would say kind of related to that. I think sometimes it's almost more a matter of like 
helping them to unlearn <laughs> some some <laughs> things that they've maybe learned that are related to many other patients and populations that they're working with, which is great, but that don't necessarily translate to um, the PSP population. I think Al's method of kind of having something written up is great just so that you've got um, a tool you're you're using over and over again and not having to recreate it because there is likely going to be some changes in, in aid staffing at some point along the way. Yep. Um, also, I know, Al, you mentioned, and I've, I've seen this a lot in the clinic too, where aides will often come to the visit with um, the individuals if you feel comfortable. Sometimes I think that is a very nice educational opportunity too, because they're kind of hearing what's going on um, and what the neurologist is asking about. And, and yeah. yeah, I think it's it a nice way to learn. Yeah, very true with the therapist. Mm -hmm. That's where they could, could really learn about the speech and swallowing difficulties. Um, you know, because I had never been involved with a speech therapist before, nor had they. Um, because as you, as you say, I don't know that that's a problem with Alzheimer's. But in any event, it's a real eye-opener as to what a speech therapist can and will do for you. And the same thing with an occupational or physical therapist. So that, that was a real uh, supplemented the education of, of the AIDS dramatically. Yeah, very true. It's a way for them to learn the tips and tricks for and strategies for supporting someone's right. daily functioning and safety, but also some, a lot of times exercises that they can help prompt mm -hmm. at, at home is something for them to do with the person. Right, which they did. But I found that yeah. great. Yep, it was really, really helpful. And this is I'll also put a plug in here and then I'm going to wrap up but a plug in here for the other Cure PSP like printed educational resources that we have on our website. A lot of times when hiring someone, people will, you know, get one of our booklets and give it to the caregivers to say, please read more about this disease and then let me know what questions you have. What, Al? <laughs> laughing. I, you know, I don't know that they'd read it. <laughs> they might. It depends on whether it's a, you know, certainly the guidebook is a little, that's a little heavy for them, I think. Well, just but no, like the some answers booklet, yeah. you know. Well, that, and I would use that for my second document. Some of the, what you have now wasn't available to me, you know. Uh, uh, the first document I went over was I, about Eileen. The second document was the typical here PSP symptoms. And that that is what I would use today yeah. and say these are, these are affecting Eileen, these are not. And then the third document I updated regularly. So uh, I, I didn't mean to smile uh, too much because, <laughs> the, but no, there, there's a lot of good information there and uh, you're, you're right. And we are developing a new resource with your help to Al right now of, you know, I won't go into it because it's not available yet, but something specifically to educate healthcare providers and professional caregivers or anybody else about, yeah. you know, this person's symptoms and care needs and all of that. So hoping that will be available to folks in the coming months. Um, okay, we've gone over. So with that, I we will wrap up. I just want to share a couple of words. And But first, Al and Katrina, wealth of information and amazing advocates. And thank you for imparting so much of your wisdom on our community through this webinar. There's so much more that we could talk about. Um, so thank you both for being here. And providing support. Um, and for folks viewing, I want to share that if we did not get to your questions today, whether you put them in the comment box or you sent them in during registration, or if you have a new question you didn't get to ask yet, please email us at info at curepsp.org and we will do our best to get you the right answers or resources from there. We might even reach out to Katrina and Al to help answer some of those questions for us. Our next Ask the Expert webinar will be on January 16th in 2024, which is wild to think about. And that one will be on the topic of gait and balance abnormalities and changes in PSP. Uh, you can learn more about that webinar and go ahead and register for it if you want. It's already up on our website on the events calendar at curepsp.org. I also want to encourage everyone to check out our YouTube channel because we have so many archived educational webinars and family conferences and our wellness workshop. All Everything that we have recorded in the past number of years is on there on so many different topics. So please check that out. 
And then lastly, it's always important to highlight that we are able to offer these webinars and all of our resources and programs, including our support groups, one of which Al co -facilit or facilitates um, because of the support of your support and the support of others in our community of Cure PSP's mission to raise awareness, build community, improve care, and find a cure for PSP, CBD, and MSA. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for hanging in a little bit over time here. Have a great rest of your day and wishing everybody a healthy and joyful holiday season and wrap up to your 2023.